Not bad, right? I tried getting into yo-yos once as a kid for two reasons. One, that one scene in the second Ninja Turtles movie where Michelangelo confuses a bunch of robbers by doing yo-yo tricks for them. And two, that one yo-yo toy that was aggressively marketed in the 90s. You know, the one that goes, hey man, it's a yo-yo ball. Yeah, that's the one. But a passing interest in yo-yos was never the reason for or cause of the Nintendo game Star Tropics. Now I've never played this. I know a few things about it thanks to word of mouth or being a favorite of so many people that I know. In fact, I never planned on playing this, but this is one of my most requested playthroughs I've ever done over on my gameplay channel. And I finally figured, you know what? Why not? It's basically baby's first RPG, right? Right? Right away, you'll notice some blatant inspirations for Star Tropics. This name entry screen is taken straight out of the original Legend of Zelda. There's more Zelda inspirations beyond that, as your life is denoted by the exact same hearts, and you can find heart containers to increase your maximum health. I know the initial reaction to this is, of course some game company ripped off Zelda. It was one of the best games ever made. But the thing is, Star Tropics was made by Nintendo. They're ripping off themselves. The whole concept behind Star Tropics is fascinating. Even though it was made by Nintendo in Japan, it was designed to appeal to Americans. They figured, well, if Legend of Zelda could do so well in the West, could they make a game for America? That's why the main character's name is Mike Jones. He loves baseball. And all the city names end in cola because Americans love soda pop. Most interestingly, Star Tropics was only ever released in the United States, in Europe, it never came out in Japan. Chapter one. One day in summer, you land at Sea Island where Dr. Jones has his laboratory. Yes, Dr. Jones, who is your uncle and is an archeologist. Do you get it? Thus, you get to explore the first island, an overworld gameplay very reminiscent of Dragon's Quest or Dragon Warrior, whatever. I think it's this gameplay that makes fans say that Star Tropics is an RPG, but quite frankly, it's about as RPG as Zelda 1 is, which is to accurately say, not at all. These are adventure games, or if you're Nintendo power, Hero Quest type of games. The best thing about Hero Quest games is being able to walk around town and talk to people. Welcome to Coral Cola. Mike, you're an ace pitcher, I hear. Show me how to throw a fastball sometime? And this pig says, oink, oink, and then he shows you his butthole. Eventually, you speak to the village leader. Which you know what? I can't help but notice this guy's hairline. It's not just him either. A lot of guys on this island are starting to recede, or worse. Looks like they could all benefit from this video's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a hair loss prevention service delivered right to your front door. It is a known fact that two out of three men will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. And the best way to prevent that is to keep the hair that you already have. Prevention is key, and the Keeps subscription service gets you a plan tailored for your needs using clinically proven treatments at a much more affordable price than any pharmacy. Their doctors and specialists are available 24-7 and will answer any question you have. Most customers will notice results within six months of starting, which is why I got mine months ago. Go to keeps.com slash pro Jared to get 50% off your first order or clicky the linky in the description. Once again, that's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash pro Jared and get 50% off. The village head of Coral Cola informs you that your uncle has been abducted, not missing or kidnapped, but abducted choice words there. And for some reason, he figures that the 15 year old who is kind of good with yo-yos is the best hope of rescuing him. Sure, dude, why not? If a 10 year old with a wooden sword can do it, so can I. Before being allowed to leave, you must also speak to the village's shaman who intimidatingly extends a grabby hand at you the entire time. This is upsetting and I hope I never have to see her again. All she says is to travel to all the islands and we're off to the very first dungeon. This is the real game right here. It becomes more of a traditional action game as you go from room to room, clearing out enemies and finding out how to open the pathway forward. Every room is a square. There are enemies to slap in the face with a yo-yo and occasionally you find a secret. It's the kind of gameplay that immediately works for me, having played so much Zelda in my life. Except Star Tropics isn't exactly like that. All the movement during action sequences is tile-based, which means you don't move a little bit or nudge when you step forward, you step forward one 
tile. The same goes for all the enemies. This allows for setting up attacks and aligning yourself quite easily. You can tell exactly where enemies will end up thanks to the feeling of this grid-based movement. It feels a bit more intuitive than it looks, but if you're smart enough and pay attention, it's easy to clear rooms of enemies without taking damage. Or you could be me. What's much more difficult to convey is how weird the controls actually are. Anytime you move, there's a delay. This is meant to allow you to turn around in place so that you can aim your attacks without having to move onto another tile, which in theory makes a lot of sense. But my god, this is the single most infuriating thing about Star Tropics. It makes it feel like there's a significant input lag to every movement you do. There will be times where you spin around in place because your brain has already registered the movement, but the game delays it. It's not just turning either. Even when you try to walk forward in the direction you're already facing, it delays the step forward. I can't stand it. It's too much. It's driving me bonkers. It goes against everything my mind has been trained to have when playing any game. Responsive controls. Imagine you tap the D-pad and a massive hand appears and says, okay, hold on, for the briefest of moments. Only it happens every time. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. This also causes times where you basically end up strafing while you're trying to move, because after you begin to move, you are committed to that step until it finishes. Attacking while moving halts you in place, causing a dissonance by further delaying the time you arrive at your desired tile and being able to move again. The only way to interrupt or reverse your movement is to go back the same way you came. And then there's no delay if you do it mid-walk. Again, I get it. It's meant to provide a window for precise aiming but the input delay is too long. If the frame length was reduced down to like a fourth of what it is, it'd be absolutely fine. The problems with the controls don't stop there. You can also jump, makes sense. You can also attack while jumping to get hits in while dodging. It's also used for puzzle solving as there are numerous gaps to jump across. Sometimes you need to jump over and attack at the same time. And often there are these blocks that can sometimes hide buttons that can only be jumped on. That's all good, all fine and dandy. However, you can only jump forward when there is a block or a gap. You cannot jump forward anywhere. If you try to do it anywhere else, you only go straight up. And much like the walking, this causes cognitive dissonance. I know I'm able to jump forward because I've done it so many times. But in the middle of combat, when my instinct has already been established to be able to jump when I need it, I find myself unable to move. This results in death, 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 oops. Death. But you do get used to it. It takes a while for it to finally click, mostly because it goes against every other contemporary example you could possibly think of, but you do get used to it. For as much as I'm complaining here, it isn't as bad after you adjust. When you play and you find yourself cursing at the controls, just know you're not alone. Even after becoming accustomed to the weird controls, I still found myself dying. Repeatedly. Worst part is, every time you lose all your lives and have to continue, you're treated with the shaman lady again, waving that hand at you in shame, taunting you, trying to get a little touch in there. The first level starts out easy. Your only enemies are slugs and slow-moving rats. You get plenty of time to learn the controls, take out some enemies. Every now and then, they drop hearts, which refills your life by one. And these stars drop. When you collect five stars, it refills your life by one. So why does it have both stars to slowly restore health and hearts to restore health? I don't know! They both drop so infrequently that it's almost not worth the effort to go for the stars. Anyway, you go from room to room, taking out enemies, finding the switch to open the door, and move on. Throughout, you can also find treasure chests for some extra limited weaponry, and tons of secrets. That's something Star Tropics does very, very well. There are so many secret paths everywhere. Sometimes they're even conveyed to the player by hinting at it with enemies, or seeing a path from an adjacent room, or just putting a little path discoloration there. Sometimes you find them from just exploring every single tile in every single room. Not just secrets and stages, there's also hidden spots in the overworld, often leading you to another heart container. It's good, and a good way to reward the player for exploring or just paying attention. Especially when you find an extra weapon. A lot of times, they are required for finishing the level or killing the boss easier. Sometimes they're just extra things. However, I will say this is one of those games where you should probably read the manual and know what each thing does, because they are super limited and wasting even one can be punishing. Like baseball bat, I get. Torch firecracker thing. Sure. This magic wand? Uh, was that a good?
Anyway, I bring these up because I found some torches in the first level, and they're super helpful versus the first boss, the giant snake. You can only hit it while the mouth is open, making getting close with a yo-yo dangerous. It's a good thing I got these torches, even though I definitely wasted some earlier. There we go. Take that. I got this. Easy pattern. Wait, uh-oh. Oh no, am I gonna run out? Ha-ha! <laughs> We're good! Rotten hell, snake skeleton bones! Wee Kids game! Wow, you've done it! I sure did. Also, the entire time you're playing, you accumulate points. And as far as I can tell, they are for nothing, they mean nothing, and the only way to get more points is to not kill enemies. Much like the controls, the exact opposite of everything we've ever been taught. Now we get the submarine and get to talk to Rob the robot. Nope, that's not a joke. And off we go. Oh no, this dolphin needs our help. Please help me find my son. Yeah, you got it, Echo. So we find a bottle on the beach, which has a special coordinates code. We tell that to Rob, and we're on our way to rescue the dolphin kid, which means a another dungeon. This one brings the difficulty to something reasonable. A decent challenge without being a pushover. I still died though. Going around, I find some more items, including this snowman. In addition to the items you pick up, you can also find other items that can only be accessed by pausing the game, pressing the d-pad, and then using them. What's the main difference between these items and these items? Well, for these ones, you need to pause the game and press the d-pad to use them. Other than that, I have no idea. I guess they're magic? The snowman item ends up being essential because the boss of the dungeon is a pissed off octopus. It's probably so mad because I murdered his Octorok kids a few rooms earlier. And he's pretty tough to fight, but the snowman freezes the water and him in place for a relentless yo-yo beatdown. And with the kid rescued, the reunited dolphin family leads me away to the next island. And by that, I mean getting caught in a storm and waking up with a mouthful of sand on the beach. Well, nothing to do from here, but move on to the next dungeon. This introduces mini dungeons where you just have to get to the end. There's no boss in these, so they're pretty short and break up the pace a bit. At least I could find some more items in here, like these bolas. Naturally, the RPG player in me is thinking, heck, better save these for when I really need them, which is usually after the credits. But with Star Tropics, you better use them right away because the moment you step out of the dungeon, they're all gone. I've never felt so punished for being frugal. The next village, which is called Miracola, and I'm already sick of this cola suffix for everything, we learn that the village elder's daughter is sick. If we save her by learning a healing spell from a mountain hermit, he'll fix a wrecked submarine. Which means, you guessed it, on to the next dungeon. You know, I actually don't mind the overworld or all the talking to NPC bits. It adds a grander sense to the adventure that otherwise wouldn't be there if you were just going level to level. It helps paint a picture of being a part of something bigger, and you get to see the positive effects of your actions. I think that's great, especially for the imaginations of kids. And it's here into the third dungeon that I realized the gloves are off. The difficulty spike here is ridiculous. Way more enemies having to traverse the dark and not fall. Freaking lava volcanoes and lava goop monsters. And oh god, what the hell is that? Undead ostriches? Yeah, I started dying here a lot. And don't forget, at every game over, she's back. Even the final boss isn't fair. It's more a puzzle than a fight, which is cool, but it involves jumping on every single block to reveal a button that you have to go press all while playing hopscotch and it spits fireballs at you. Okay, there's one, no problem. So then the other's over here? Wait, where is it? Ah ha! I hit every other spot, where can- Oh, you cannot be serious. You have to precariously hop around directly in front of the fire monster to find the activation step, then hop all the way back around just to kill it? Then why did you get all these stupid weapons? Whatever, I got them. Listen, there's even happy triumphant music to let me know I did a good job. See, look, wow, you've done it. Of course, we're not done yet. The nearby city is Shikola, and it's controlled entirely by women, and they only let girls in. But circle around back, and you find, I guess, the sole outcasted grandma fortune teller who needs her crystal ball back from the graveyard. So you know what that means. Yup, more dungeons. This one is a bit sneaky, because it actually has like three different exits. And every time you take one, whoop, you're back in the graveyard. Try it again, different exit, same result. You can keep doing this in a forever loop until you realize, like me, that this one slug here is actually hiding a secret path. <sighs> All right, I'm gonna speed things along here. I got to the end, killed a spooky ghost, got the crystal ball, bring it back to the fortune teller, and she turns you into a girl. What? Oh no, what a wacky reversal of roles. Guys can't be girls, that's too silly. Oh, 90s, I love how nothing about you will ever age poorly. Speaking of, after Mrs. Doubtfiring my way into the city, the leader here is impressed of all the ghost killing and powers up the yo-yo. Now when my hearts are high enough, it has a longer reach and does more damage. Neat, 
also informed me how to get up to the path to the mountain. You have to stand here and jump 10 times and say Abracadabra. Look, I didn't say that. Instead, I said the names of way better Pokemon. Caterpie, Snom, Scyther, yay, it worked. But of course, nothing is easy, which means another dungeon to get to the mountain hermit. To further up the difficulty, now there are blocks that intermittently sink and ones that sink the moment you land on them, just to make the platforming even more obnoxious. So sometimes you see stuff like, oh God, oh man, I want those hearts. Maybe I can just, ah! look at this. There's even straight up invisible blocks to jump on. This is getting ridiculous. And this dungeon is long. At least it ends with riding a water geyser up to the top of the mountain. Weehee! Okay, that's kind of fun. The Hermit on the Mountain gives a healing spell on a scroll. You give it to the village elder, who then has a stroke, and then his daughter wakes up. Submarine fixed. Hooray! Now we can finally move on to the next- OH GOD! Now we're trapped inside a whale. This entire chapter takes place inside the whale, but for once, there's no dungeon. It's only exploring with limited sight range and using the sub's dive ability to find hidden passages. Ultimately, it's really boring, but I'm thankful there was some full-on exploring to break up the constant dungeons. I actually liked it. You find a lighter, burn this guy's only means of survival at sea, and the whale sneezes you out. He's your uncle's assistant and informs you that you need to dip your uncle's letter in water? So this is probably the most famous thing of Star Tropics. In every single brand new copy, there was an actual printed letter from your uncle, Dr. Jones. What the game is telling you is to take that letter and to literally dip it into water. This then reveals a hidden code to enter in on the submarine. Again, what a cool way to make a kid in the 90s feel like they're part of a bigger adventure. Now, if you rented the game or bought it used or you're borrowing it, or say you're playing it on the Nintendo Switch's online NES library, get fucked. By the way, in case you need it, the code is 747. Next is another island with the only path blocked by a huge ship. Even though we are a submarine and could feasibly go under it, we gotta find some other way to get around it. To do this, we need to go to the hidden tower of the ship's captain who loves oversized keyboards. Playing a specific song will open the way, but you can only learn the song from the captain's parrot, who is in the jungle all the way back at town. Oh, but he won't give it to you for free. You have to give the parrot a worm. Then you learn the song. Go back to the tower, Tom hangs it, and now you can go into to the next dungeon for the ship. The game just keeps getting harder from here. Now there's literal bowling ball death traps, collapsing floors along with free health meant to trick you into death, spear traps from out of nowhere, these metal spheres that you have to hit yourself to make them bounce around, and then you have to carefully dodge a trap of your own doing. And wait, ah! Oh, come on, now that's just not fair. Oh, thank God, at least I found a room with an extra life in it. Well, it made me lose a life? Why? I'm thankful here, there is no boss. Die, boat. Following your uncle's signal, you eventually come to a crater and continue the search for him in an underwater dungeon. What's actually pretty cool about this dungeon is that early on, you get a power-up that turns Mike orange and now allows him to jump farther. It's a minor difference, but this switch up in what you know is a good way to variate the gameplay and allow for some new puzzle solving. And by puzzle solving, I mean jumping on blocks. Oh, hey there, little guy. What do you do? Oh, nothing? Cool. Easy then. Oh, no. Oh, no. Did I kill your son back there? Whoops. Here, you can join him. Boom. Easy dungeon. We even got the victory music again, and we can already move on to the next chapter. What? There's more dungeon? But you played the happy music. I gotta do more? Well, at least at this point, there's not a whole lot of more ways the game can throw bullshit at me. Oh, come on! There's probably a secret button somewhere in here, but I'm gonna be real. I choose not to look for it. Kill a stupid Maui head boss with baseballs to the mouth and continue exploring the underground cavern, pass a weird meteorite, go through yet another dungeon, and eventually come across your uncle, Dr. Steve Jones. He goes on to explain that the meteorite actually had three magic cubes in it and that it was being chased by an alien spaceship to here on Earth and now the aliens have the magic cubes. So go take your yo-yo and get them back, kid. Well, at least we're at the final chapter. The alien ship is a full-on labyrinth as there's no longer clear rooms to make your way through and teleporters that bring you to somewhere. There's also tons of alien guards with laser guns and jet bikes that come out of nowhere. Just finding your way forward is a huge pain. And in case you're thinking, well, how hard could this be at this point? Look at how much health you have. I'd like to calmly point out that most things deal a ludicrous amount of damage to you in this entire dungeon. These hearts are a false sense of security. 
but at least you can also find your own laser gun to fight back with. It helps you shoot the next set of robot mini bosses. Then you find the first magic cube, which further powers up the yo yo to have maximum range and damage. This all leads up to another robot boss, which again is a puzzle boss. Instead of killing it, you need to drop the platform and hit it enough to back it into the pit. It's another good boss, and I did it with one heart left. Go through a labyrinth of stupid, find another magic cube, and now you have maximum life. But the spaceship is taking off, and the game's true villain reveals himself. Zoda, an imposing Sauron-like figure who is so imposing and evil that the only way to prevent his evil aura is to jam bananas into your ears. Immediate boss fight. Grab the gun. Don't get diddled. Also, I want to point out that getting the second magic cube gave me full health, but as soon as the next chapter started with the Zoda fight, it automatically reset me back down to three. Thanks, game. After enough bullets, Zoda explodes, losing his disguise and exposing his true form, which is so embarrassing he runs off into the darkness. And then, of course, one more dungeon. At least it's pretty quick, and it ends by destroying this warp core thing, which also explodes the entire ship. Now all that's left is the final showdown with Zoda, which I actually rather like this final battle, because even though Zoda is this huge, imposing monster, he does cute little hops like you. See, Zoda? We're not so different, you and I. Well, I guess a little different, because you're dead. With that, the final magic cube is obtained, an escape pod drops back to Earth, Mike swims for a bit, gets tired, drowns, and dies. Seriously, I didn't edit that in. That's what happens. But it's okay, because Dolphin Friend has saved us. We're back at the first island, where everyone is going to celebrate with a big feast. Wait, a big feast? Where is- No! No! Butthole Pig! No! Oh, also, those three cubes, they transform and release seven alien children, the last of their species. Only this one's pissed about it, this one's a vampire, and this one's an idiot. Sorry about your race. I hope you're not siblings because repopulating might get weird. Credits roll along with some honestly nice pixel art memories of the journey. Ah, yes. Remember when this happened? And then we did this? Ha <laughs> ha. Yay! Bananas. The end. It's surprising to me how many people love this game. Like, love it, love it. They'll scream up and down about how it's such a good game. And it is, mostly. It has a lot of good things going for it. Good graphics, good music, good sense of adventure. The dungeons continually evolve themselves and offer new tweaks to what's expected to keep things fresh. There are tons of different items and power-ups, loads of secrets to find, and consistent progression to make it an enjoyable playthrough. However, obviously, the controls are not great. It's the kind of controls that we either click with you, or they won't. In my case, it didn't, and I muscled my way through it anyway. The difficulty spikes are also completely ridiculous, and there are way too many LOL GOTCHA moments, where the game punishes the player immediately without any kind of forewarning. As frustrating as it was at times, the dungeons are cool and the boss fights are kinda awesome. It may be seen as derivative of Zelda, but I think Star Tropics is strong enough to stand on its own. I wouldn't go far to say that it's an all-time NES classic. There is a reason that Star Tropics has zero representation in Smash Brothers. It is an oddity on the NES that is worth checking out, especially since it already stands in the colossal shadows of more famous games. And if you use your imagination just right, you can practically taste the ultimate reward. Juicy Roast Pig Butthole.